Okay, so my analysis of political correctness is a little bit different from what is usually heard. But before I get to the core of that analysis, I would like to make a few points. First, political correctness is defined by Wikipedia as, quote, language, policies, or measures that are intended not to offend or disadvantage any particular group of people in society, end quote. Now, if we just limit this definition to particular sensitive words, I would argue it is something that is used across the political spectrum. So it is not only left-leaning or radical left uh, people and activists, like people using so-called uh, gender-neutral pronouns, or you know, words like colored instead of black, or overweight instead of fat, etc. But everyday words used by all of us, the media, and uh, major centers of power primarily. To give a few examples, take say the word associate used by businesses and corporations. It is obviously meant to downplay the wealth distribution and uh, top-down line of authority in the institution and thus not offend those on top. Words like worker, wage laborer, low wage worker, or even high wage worker are more accurate and descriptive, but these words are not politically correct. Certainly the term wage slave, which was used extensively in the 19th century apparently, is today very politically incorrect. It is much more politically correct to describe a sweatshop worker as an associate in a free market than as a wage slave. The fact that terms like associate don't even come up in discussions of political correctness indicates an even deeper internalization of political correctness than with terms that are at least discussed or questioned. Or take, say, the word serve in relation to the military, as in the phrase, I served in Iraq. <coughs> it is taken for granted that members of, you know, say, the U.S. military serve the American people. Of course, the war in Iraq did not serve the American people at all. In fact, quite the opposite. So at best, the U.S. troops served some sections of the American elite in violation of international law, causing great amounts of death, destruction, and destabilization in the process. It is now politically correct for Republicans to say that the war in Iraq was a mistake, a blunder, though before it was only politically correct for liberals to say so. However, it is, and it was, always politically incorrect to state the obvious truth that it is the biggest crime so far in the 21st century, the invasion of Iraq. But you know, Without getting bogged down too much in the myriad of particular terms we could analyze from our everyday speech, if we are going to look more generally at, quote, language, policies, or measures that are intended not to offend or disadvantage any particular group of people in society, a major category is simply the propaganda catering to people that already have advantages, namely elite groups in society, usually either through messages in entertainment or encouraging a lively debate within a framework of fixed presuppositions in the news. And books like Manufacturing Consent have looked at the question of propaganda seriously and in depth even though it could be categorized as belonging to the radical left, at least by some people. So it seems to me a bit of a narrow perspective to just focus on the political correctness of social activists and the radical and center left, which yes, of course, is also real. I'm not denying that. Here I would like to bring up uh, Ted Kaczynski's Unabomber Manifesto, which was published in 1995, over 20 years ago, and talks quite articulately uh, 
about the uh, left's uh, political correctness. Uh, Kaczynski, I should say, despite being a primitivist and criticizing um, the political correctness of social activists, he did identify himself in many ways with what is termed as the far left. And that, by the way, is also how he was described by Timothy McVeigh, who was no dummy. Now, in his manifesto, I'm going to read, uh, Kaczynski says the following. Uh, Leftists may claim that their activism is motivated by compassion or by moral principle, and moral principle does play a role for the leftist of the over-socialized type. But compassion and moral principle cannot be the main motives for leftist activism. Uh, hostility is too prominent a component of leftist behavior, so is the drive for power. Uh, moreover, much leftist behavior is not rationally calculated to be of benefit to the people whom the leftists claim to be trying to help. For example, if one believes that affirmative action is good for black people, does it make sense to demand affirmative action in hostile and dogmatic terms? Obviously, it would be more productive to take a diplomatic and conciliatory approach that would make at least a verbal and symbolic concessions to white people who think that affirmative action discriminates against them. But leftist activists do not take such an approach because it would not satisfy their emotional needs. Uh, helping black people is not their real goal. Instead, race problems serve as an excuse for them to express their own hostility and frustrated need for power. In doing so, they actually harm black people because the activist's hostile attitude toward the white majority tends to intensify race hatred. If our society had no social problems at all, the leftists would have to invent problems in order to provide themselves with an excuse for making a fuss. Uh, we emphasize that the foregoing does not pretend to be an accurate description of everyone who might be considered a leftist. It is only a rough indicator of a general tendency of leftism. Okay, so that's Kaczynski in the manifesto. Now, the left-wing anarchist thinker, Noam Chomsky, also, in a video titled uh, Science, Religion, and Human Nature, which you can look up on YouTube, is asked about what he thinks about so-called left criticisms of science. Chomsky, in response, describes all the nonsense that went on in part, you know, in, in, in Paris cafes by so-called leftist intellectuals, as well as all the various ways in which in the humanities and anthropology and you know, comparative literature departments at universities, language and reality are distorted by so-called uh, leftist thinkers in order to enhance their prestige and their self-esteem. Um, accusing those who criticize their distortions as, you know, in Chomsky's words, of being white, male, sexist, bourgeois, and other such epithets. Now, this description of our morality or, you know, our moral impulses, our moral instincts, being subordinate to our need for self-esteem and our need to invent cultural meanings and problems in order to enhance that self-esteem is one that I think fits with a much more general theory of not only political correctness and uh, language censoring, but our motivations for cultural meaning creation in general. This is what is called terror management theory. And since I'm going to discuss Jordan Peterson in a second, uh, partly because of the recent events at the University of Toronto, in which, by the way, I do agree with many of his objections, I will play a clip where he uh, provides what I think is a deeply misguided explanation of Ernest Becker and terror management theory, which is the you know, subsequent empirical testing of uh, Becker's ideas. As I will explain, Peterson unknowingly embraces the main driving force behind political correctness, which is a faith in progress as a personal self-esteem project. Well, there's this idea that our meaning systems, that's the internal structure we use to organize the chaos of the world, protect us from the anxiety of death. 
And then, so that's one form of meaning for Becker. And which modern is, mor mortality salience theory. Yeah, it's the same thing. The, it's, yeah. it's, that's Becker's, that's Becker's, yeah. it's an elaboration of Becker. It doesn't really have much to add to Becker, actually. Right. So, um, so, so there's something that's right about that, because we do use our belief systems to defend ourselves. But we should be very clear about this. Okay, first of all, culture is not a belief system. I agree the representation that. of culture is a belief system. Mm -hmm. That is not the same thing. Culture is what's keeping the electricity on. Okay. And that's not defending us against death anxiety, although it is. It's actually defending us against death, which is much better, right? Because we're not sitting outside freezing to death, right? And that's, there's nothing psychological about that. It's like, there are the lights. It's warm. The floor isn't moving. John isn't attacking me. And, you know, <laughs> no, seriously. It's like, <laughs> right. That's not belief, man. That's that he's not attacking me. And so we represent that belief, and that also makes it somewhat pliable and manipulable and fragile because we can also undermine it. But culture protects us from death, and the representation of culture protects us sometimes from death anxiety. Okay, so now, Becker also pointed out that there was something else that seemed to give life meaning, and that was associated with the Cartesian notion of consciousness. So he thought that people were... Um, Apart from being protected from terror, which we needed to be, we also needed to convince ourselves that our lives were worthwhile. And we basically did that by deluding ourselves that we were engaged in some sort of heroic project. And somehow we could deceive ourselves well enough about the import of that, through self-deception mostly, that that also added another layer of meaning to our life. Okay. The problem with Becker, fundamentally, was that he didn't read Jung. And he said right in the introduction to his book, I've never had any patience for Jung, and I never thought he said anything to say about in his books on alchemy. And that was really too bad, because if he would have read them, he would have got the book right instead of wrong. There's the meaning of chaos. Look out. It's promise and catastrophe. We have the meaning of order. That's security and tyranny. And then we have the meaning of exploration. And that's the hero myth. And it's not a false thing, it's not self-deception. It's like, you're out there transforming chaos into order, and that's habitable territory for you and everyone else. It's like, otherwise it's bloody freezing to death and chewing on bones with the dogs, you know? It's like, we don't want to do that. So, it's not, it's not non-real. And we also don't know how far we can push it. Like, if all of you stayed properly on the border between it, order and chaos, and we're attempting to rectify in your environment everything you could in a meaningful way. It's like God only knows how much better you could make the world. <clears throat> First, let me point out that in contrast with Jung's speculations about the human psyche, we have over 30 years of terror management theory studies uh, with hundreds of double-blind experiments across many cultures, providing a direct causal relationship between our cultural beliefs and an unconscious death anxiety. The link between religion and death anxiety is, of course, very well established as well, and theories proposing an adaptive evolutionary purpose to religion have failed, in my view, to provide any substantial evidence. Also, though some parts of culture, like some of the uses of electricity, were or could have been invented or developed with the motivation of survival, huge parts of culture are not. I mean, if our cultural creations were simply attempts to survive by mediating between order and chaos, you wouldn't mediate the process through arbitrary systems of abstract meaning unrelated to specific adaptive threats. A huge number of activities and beliefs or meaning systems in our culture are unrelated to specific adaptive threats. So it makes much more sense to view these cultural creations as spandrels, that is, as byproducts of the evolution of some other characteristic, rather than a direct product of adaptive selection. Terror management theory <coughs> does accept that our intelligence, our moral instincts, and various other mental functions did originally evolve to help us survive, and in the words of Peterson, to, among other things, 
help us organize and mediate between the order and chaos of the world. Yes, the theory explains that as a byproduct of our intelligence and self-awareness, we developed an end of self-awareness, an awareness of our animal insignificance and finitude that created such great anxiety that it had to be countered with activities and beliefs that would give us the illusion that we are persons of value in a world of enduring meaning. This is what we call culture. There are two main categories of cultural illusion, according to Becker. One that provides us with cosmic significance and uh, literal immortality, and one that provides us with earthly importance and legacy, or symbolic immortality. Becker posited that without a great sense of cosmic significance, humans could not successfully quell their death anxiety and achieve satisfactory self-esteem. He argued that the shift toward agriculture, surplus, and uh, materialism in civilization meant that cosmic significance, as well as literal immortality, were undermined. Whereas primitive religions are deemed to have provided great cosmic significance to everyone in the tribe, it subsequently came to be concentrated in elite figures like pharaohs and kings and queens with delayed and conditional otherworldly rewards for the rest of the population. This left the world in a chronic state of deficient self-esteem with a predictable increased search, invention, and emphasis on less fulfilling, more earthly sources of personal significance and symbolic immortality that is, legacy. This includes things like national identity, money, progress, jobs, hobbies, and new self-esteem enhancing perceptions of social arrangements like family, marriage, and even friendship, uh, as well as inflations of day-to-day -day triviality. A central property of these human sources of self-esteem is that they overwhelmingly feature narrow focus strategies, what Becker calls fetishes. Since we are insignificant in the big scheme of things, we focus on a small or narrow aspect of real or invented reality where we can more easily gain a sense of personal significance. In other words, we, you know, to use a cliche, we tend to major in minors. This, unfortunately, makes us um, oblivious or intolerant to other realities, including the wider ones that would permit a more rational appraisal of the world. In the case of progress, there's a very interesting tariff management uh, study called um, Things Will Get Better, the Anxiety Buffering Qualities of Progressive Hope that carries out experiments showing uh, that, quote, bolstering belief in progress buffered the effects of mortality salience and diminished subsequent defensive reactions to a cultural worldview-threatening essay. In other words, it showed that um, progress, like some of our other most cherished uh, cultural sources of self-esteem, also provides a buffer against uh, death anxiety. In the words of John Gray, quote, we seek in the idea of progress what theists found in the idea of providence, an assurance that history need not be meaningless. We do not want to be confronted with regression and want to believe that history is not cyclic, but indeed progressive. Moral progress, for example, imbues the course of history with meaning. We've come a long way. Whereas the idea that history is cyclic can render any progress obtained meaningless because then, ultimately, there is only moral gain and loss. Now, what's described as progress usually entails things like increases in wealth, advances in technology, or perceived improvements in moral behavior. 
So when these things take place in an environment that struggles and hungers for earthly self-esteem in every direction, there are bound to be ideological constraints placed on language in the course of that struggle. Peterson is stating that if we, uh, quote, attempt to rectify in our environment everything we could in a meaningful way, God only uh, knows how much better you can make the world, he is directly embracing the utopian ideology of progress, underpinning much of political correctness. Now, why is it that uh, primitives, the most static, non-progressive, and uh, materially scarce individuals ever, uh, did not pin their self-esteem on rectifying everything they could in their environment to make it a better world? The answer is simple. They had a much stronger source of self-esteem coming from their highly spiritual lifestyle, which afforded them a sense of cosmic significance and immortality, which is what humans really are after. Progress, just like money or national identity, is, in the big picture, not only a weaker provider of illusory significance, but is itself illusory in many ways. For example, uh, while from a moral perspective humans may have made progress in killing each other less, interhuman violence can only be considered a small percentage of human immorality. Humans are only one species. And after all, human violence throughout history has only killed a tiny percentage of the human species. The ecocidal destruction of countless other species is the bulk of human immorality. And that has increased exponentially. And so have the number of animals tortured for human consumption. Most of the mammal biomass on the planet, actually. Technological improvements have enhanced uh, certain aspects of life, like decreased infant mortality and increased longevity. But with recent reports of 58% of the Earth featuring unsafe levels of biodiversity, compromising things like future food production, uh, nutrient cycling and pollination, compounded on the effects of global warming, all mainly taking place as a result of the industrial era with its production, science, technology, etc., known as progress, uh, the long-term survival prospects of humanity today are actually lower. They're worse than in the Paleolithic, which, by the way, gave birth to most of the people who have ever walked the Earth. Countless generations in a lowly populated Earth. So the longevity and advantages of a few generations do not make up for the countless generations of humans who will be deprived of life as a result. This is a much larger number of people deprived of life. In other words, how can there be progress with far fewer years of life enjoyed by a species? That is, with far worse survival prospects as compared to the most non-progressive, least materially abundant era ever. Here, as a final note, I may point out that while I agree, in essence, with Peterson's objections to the politically correct impositions of his employer, he has, as a result of pinning his hopes for progress on uh, democratic capitalist political notions, ignored the evidence against his idea that you know, what he labels as Marxist restrictions on information flow are uh, historically the biggest uh, causers of genocide. And this evidence was provided by Nobel Prize winning economist Amartya Sen, who pointed out that in India, the democratic capitalist quote-unquote experiment, as he calls it from 1947 to 1979, had caused more deaths than in the entire history of communism everywhere since 1917. Over 100 million deaths. 
What happened basically was that in the late 1950s, uh, life expectancy in China plunged for several years to far below that of India because of a huge famine, which took an estimated 30 million lives. Amartya Sen attributes the famine to the nature of the Chinese regime, which did not react for three years and may not even have been aware of the scale of the famine because of the totalitarian conditions, which blocked information flow. Now, nothing similar happened in India with its pluralistic democracy. Nevertheless, Sen calculates that if China's lower mortality rates prevailed in India, there would have been close to 4 million fewer deaths a year all the way into the mid-1980s. This indicates, in Sen's words, that, quote, every eight years or so, more people in addition died in India in comparison with Chinese mortality rates than the total number that died in the gigantic Chinese famine. This, once again, is over 100 million deaths in one single capitalist country, as many or more as in all of the communist countries in the world put together. In any case, I will reiterate here that the loss of future human generations resulting from the environmental destruction inflicted by any modern industrial system, whether communist, capitalist, or anything else, is likely in the hundreds of billions with a B, which dwarfs those caused by inner human violence and oppression. That is the price of progress, which is a category much larger than political correctness.